when I was in Thailand. I gave a Dhamma talk on some of John Fuang's teachings. And the two words that he stressed the most, which were be observant as you meditate and as you go through the day, and use your ingenuity, the Thai word Bhatipan. This is an important part of working with the breath, because you've got different energies in the body and you can do lots of different things with the breath energies, good or bad. And if you find that the energy is bad, you have to think of some ways of dealing with it. Some of the ways that John Lee lays out in his books, his Dharma talks. One of the principles he shows in his books and his Dharma talks is he didn't stick with one paradigm for how the breath should flow in the body. He had lots of different ways of conceiving it. And where did he get them? John Fung told the story of how John Lee, being in India, had observed the different rishis and sadhus standing out under the sun on one leg, lying on beds of nails. He asked himself, how did they do that? And his way of getting the answer was, of course, to look into his own meditation. And he came up with the answers that they were playing with their breath. This looked like a good, skilled master he saw. So he worked on it on his own. He may have gotten some ideas of what he saw, what they were doing. But he kept coming up with new ways, because his body presented him with new problems, presented him with a heart attack one time. He had to figure out how to use the breath to work with that. That's where we got method two. But the important thing is he gives the basic principles and also shows ways of playing with them. After I gave the talk, one of the Western monks who was there, who understood Thai well and had been in Thailand a number of years, came up and he said in all of his years of being in Thailand he'd never heard anybody use the word ingenuity in a Dharma talk. And that's kind of scary, because when you're off meditating on your own, there can't be somebody holding your hand all the time, telling you what to do. You've got to figure out the problem. And if an approach you've tried in the past doesn't work, you've got to figure out something new. So somebody has to be encouraged using your ingenuity. Maybe the Johns nowadays are afraid that their students are a little bit too far afield. They want to make sure that they're doing as they're told first. And that is a part of the practice. We've got the video, we've got the rules. You don't use your ingenuity around those that very much, especially. Don't use your ingenuity to figure out ways of circumventing the rules. But when it comes to looking into your mind, you've got to learn how to think for yourself. Turn your ideas inside and out. As John Lee would say, when you had an insight, ask yourself to what extent is the opposite true? That's when he gives recommendations for having the breath flow down the spine. There are Dharma talks where he has it flowing up. You have to figure out, is this the right time for it to go up or to go down? When I was translating, keeping the breath in mind, I found that there were various additions and his ways of talking about the breath energy in the different additions was, was different. In one edition he talks about the breath outside the body, which he doesn't mentioned in later editions. It's a shame that he left that out, because it provides an alternative for times when the breath energy inside the body just seems to be all a mess and nothing seems to work. You can think about it flowing around outside. Think of the body of having an aura of breath energy, a cocoon of breath energy around it. And ask yourself, where does it feel bad? What could you do to straighten it out? And this principle of ingenuity doesn't apply only to a John Lee or John Fung. You notice it in a John Cha and a John Mahabua. They don't talk about it, but they certainly exemplify it. A John Cha and all his many similes. A John Mahabua and the questions he asks, say, around pain, 
other issues that come up to mind. He's was very good at framing unusual questions, getting at it, the, the issue of the relationship between the pain and the mind and the body in different ways. Because as he saw, you can approach pain in one way in one day and get results. And then you try that same approach the next day and you don't get results. After all, pain can be related to different things in the mind. You look at dependent co-arising, you see where feeling appears in dependent co-arising in lots of different places, lots of different contexts. In some cases it's in there with the different kinds of fabrication, bodily, verbal, mental. And so maybe the way you're breathing has something to do with the problem of the pain. Maybe the way you're talking to yourself has something to do with the problem or the perceptions you hold in mind. Feeling also appears in name and form. There it's associated with attention. What are you paying attention to when you're suffering from a pain, a physical pain? What, could you change that? What are your intentions around the pain? And what intentions do you think the pain has toward you? That again is an issue of perception. So the problem of pain from one day to the next may be a different problem. So you've got to use your ingenuity in coming up with a new approach. So these things are exemplified in the teachings of the Ajans, even if they don't talk about it. And you find it in the Buddhist teachings, after all. The word bodhipana is a Pali term, and it does appear in the canon. It's not in any of the standard lists, except for one very important list. The Buddha's talking about the qualities you need to develop, the things you have to be sensitive to, to have all around discernment. And one of them is having a sense of yourself. What are your strengths right now in the practice? What are your weaknesses? And as you measure yourself in terms of six qualities, how is your conviction? Is your conviction strong or is it weak right now? Are you convinced of the Buddha's awakening or are you convinced of other teachings that you've picked up here and there? Then it's a question of virtue. How meticulous are you about your precepts, your generosity? Are you truly generous with the things you have? And that's not just things. Are you generous with your knowledge? Are you generous with your time? Are you generous with your forgiveness? And there's learning. How much do you know? The Buddha said you want to take as your standard for judging what's dharma, what's in the suttas and what's in the vinaya. So it's good to have a good knowledge of these things. If you think about the Thayajans, not knowing much about the suttas, they certainly knew a lot about the vinaya, that's for sure. And the more you read in the suttas, you begin to see the analogies that a John Lee and a John Cha say would, would use but often have their roots in something inside the suttas. So it's good to have some knowledge so you can compare your insights when they come up, because that's one of the tests. So you have a vision of a deva coming to talk to you or the Buddha coming to talk to you. The question of whether it really is a deva or really is the Buddha is not the question. The question is, what are they saying, and does it fit in with the drama? And the more you know of the suttas, the more you know of the vinya, the better you have a chance of figuring out if this is something that's in line with the Dharma or not. And even then, the question is, does it really work? You have to put it to the test. This is where the next quality comes in, which is discernment. How clearly do you see what's going on in your own body and mind? And particularly, how clearly do you see? where you're causing suffering and what you can do to stop. And then there's the sixth quality, which is ingenuity. How good, at your, how good are you at figuring things out? And a lot of figuring things out has to do with figuring out what's a good analogy for what's going on in your body and mind right now. There's a whole body of thought around the idea that 
our thinking, even though we may use abstract terms, is never really abstract. There are hidden metaphors behind the way our language shapes things. And you want to be sensitive. Well, what are the metaphors you're applying? Are you applying the right metaphor? This is why the Buddha would engage in cross-questioning. Someone would ask him a question, and he wanted to make sure that the person had the right paradigm for understanding the answer. As when he was asked if he would ever say anything unpleasant. It was a trick question. This, a prince had been put up to asking the question by some Nagantas. With the idea that the Buddha said, yes, he would say things that were unpleasant, then the re retort could be, well, what's the difference between you and ordinary people down in the market? And if he said he never would say anything unpleasant, then they had him on record for saying things about David Dotton that David Dotton didn't like, the idea, the fact that David Dotton was going to go to hell for having caused a split in the Sangha. So the prince posed the question of the Buddha, and the Buddha says there's no categorical answer to that. And before he explained how he would determine when to say something pleasant and when to say something unpleasant, he asked the prince, suppose your baby son got a sharp object in his mouth, what would you do? The prince said, well, I'd hold his hand, <clears throat> hold his head in one hand, and with my other hand, use the finger to get the sharp object out. Why? Because even if it meant drawing blood. Why? Because I have compassion for the child. But said in the same way, there are times when you have to say something harsh out of compassion. So he gave the paradigm. Then he gave the answer. So when we read the similes in the Buddhist teachings and teachings of the Ajahns, they're not just there for decoration. They're there to help us understand, to give us the right pattern for thinking. And it was the Buddha's ingenuity that he was able to, to see what precisely was the appropriate analogy. There's a sutta where a monk has been asked by a prince who is a relative of his, if making a wish makes a difference in your practice. And the monk answered, well, whether you wish for results or don't wish for results, if you do the practice correctly, you're going to get results. If you don't do it correctly, you're not going to get results, no matter how much you wish for the results. The prince decided that was a reasonable answer, shared some of his food with the monk. The monk then went to see the Buddha, and the Buddha said, what you said was right. And then the Buddha goes on to give a whole series of analogies. If you want to get milk out of a cow, if you're twisting the horn, then no matter how much you want the milk, you're not going to get the milk. You pull on the udder, you get the milk, even if you don't wish for milk. But if you happen to pull on the udder, then you're going to get milk. It goes down through a whole series of analogies like this. And the Buddha said if you had given these analogies, then the prince would have been even more impressed with your answer. And the monk said, well, how could those analogies have occurred to me? Because they're yours. It's interesting, the verb they use there, they actually have a verb for ingen ingenuity. Because you're saying ingenuitize. And the active part of the verb is not what your mind does, it's what the idea does. The idea comes to you. So this is part of what ingenuity means, is that you leave your mind open to new ideas coming in. Where they come from doesn't really matter. The question is, are they appropriate? So it's good to leave your mind open for new possibilities. Because after all, we're, we suffer because of our limited range of what we think is possible. We have to open our minds and say, yes, true happiness is possible. It is possible for someone like the Buddha to gain awakening and to be able to teach the way to others. That's what conviction is all about. So think of the, the Dharma as opening possibilities in your mind that weren't there before, things that you had closed off without having even thought about it. And then try to develop this quality of ingenuity in yourself. 
the Buddha encourages it in his meditation instructions. You read the 16 steps, and they're like a set of 16 riddles. They start with two steps, discerning short breathing, discerning long breathing. So what does it mean, discern? Do you simply watch willy-nilly, see what the breath does on its own? Or do you try to explore cause and effect? Because when the Buddha talks about discernment being penetrative, it's more than just watching things arising and passing away. It's understanding cause and effect. So does it mean that you experiment with the breath to see what long breathing does for you and what short breathing does for you, and you decide which is better? Because that's one of the ways in which you can understand discernment. And then the question is, which way of understanding is better? Which gets better results? This is to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out. What does that do? And how do you do that? He also talks about breathing in sensitive to rapture, sensitive to pleasure. What if you don't feel any rapture, don't feel any pleasure? What do you do? We know that when rapture and pleasure do come, you're supposed to spread them through the body. How do you do that? And John Lee gives some answers with his analysis of the breath energies. There's something to fill in some of the blanks. But there's still a lot of blanks in, the, in those steps. Same with the factors for awakening. The Buddha says there are potentials in the body for a rapture, there are potentials in the body for ease. There's a potential for energy. And you pay appropriate attention to it. Well, where is that potential? Where are those potentials? It leads you you to find them out. In other words, she's encouraging you to explore. We're not here just copying and pasting the Buddha's discernment into our minds. He's giving us questions to ask and telling us which questions don't get results and which questions do get results. But it's up to us to find the answers, and that's where the ingenuity comes in. So think of this as a tradition of ingenuity, a tradition in the sense that it directs you through its questions, and it gives you an idea of what some of the possibilities are that following this path can do. And then it encourages you to follow the Buddha's example in being ingenious and figuring out how to get past problems. And we have the example that all the problems that are in the mind that could get in the way of awakening have been solved by somebody someplace. So take that as encouragement. That is a possibility you should be open to. And see what that kind of openness does for your mind.